Hello there guys, and welcome back to another Trade the Explainer video, and hopefully that break wasn't so bad. Today, we are kind of returning to my Young Earth Creationist claims and Did Humans and Dinosaurs Coexist series. Well, kind of. This video certainly started out like that, but over time it became kind of something I found far more fascinating and a bit off topic from the original video. But I hope you find it interesting nonetheless. So, without further ado, let's start my in-depth examination of Leviathan. A popular claim made by Young Earth creationists and other people that believe humans and dinosaurs coexisted is the description in the book of Job in the Hebrew Bible of two creatures, Leviathan and Behemoth. They suggest that the description of both of these creatures are eyewitness accounts of actual animals, most likely extinct reptiles like dinosaurs, mosasaurs, plesiosaurs, and etc., and thus dispute the scientific model that humans did not coexist with such animals. In this video, we'll be focusing on the creature Leviathan first, and try to figure out the answer to the question, what is Leviathan exactly? Well, Leviathan appears in the Bible a few times, six to be exact, but only rather briefly and in passing, in a manner as if the reader should already kind of know what it is. Well, we can first learn a bit from the word Leviathan itself. Firstly, the word is singular and denotes an individual as opposed to a species. The word is a name for a specific individual, like the Minotaur, or the Hydra, or Jormungandr. The etymology or origin of the word associates it with the Hebrew words of to coil, to twist, and its name translates to the twisting one, or the wreath-like one, or the circular one. The name itself is strongly associated with descriptions of a snake, particularly one in an Ouroboros position. Additionally, this aspect of Leviathan's name has been suggested by some scholars to suggest Leviathan is a primeval sea serpent that encircles the earth with its body, which is a belief held by some of the Israelites' neighbors. Some Babylonian artwork often depicts a giant serpent coiled around the earth in a circle, serving as its foundations, and this seems reminiscent of the Norse mythological serpent of Jormungandr, or the world serpent, which similarly surrounds the earth with its body. These legends are in turn reminiscent of other mythologies where a giant serpent, like monster, serves as the foundation of Earth, particularly the ones of Sumer, in which the defeated giant sea serpent Tiamat's corpse is used. Because of all this, scholars have suggested that Leviathan may, or may not, have served a similar purpose in ancient Hebrew mythology, as a giant creature that encircles the globe, or whose body serves as its foundation. And this is somewhat further supported by the actual textual evidence we will examine later. The longest description of Leviathan occurs in the book of Job, but it is briefly mentioned in Psalms, Amos, and Isaiah in passing, essentially as a mere illusion or name drop, if you will. So let's look at the text and look at the description given. In Job, Leviathan and Behemoth are alluded to in a speech by Yahweh, or God, that he gives to Job, a man who is questioning God for making him suffer. In his speech, God essentially says humanity is ignorant and weak, unable to comprehend or understand his knowledge and reasons, and therefore God should not be questioned. Several mysteries for people of that age are mentioned by God in a form of a question. Do you know how God controls the clouds and makes his lightning flash? Do you know how the clouds hang? Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea and walked in the recesses of the deep? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you understand. Who marked off the dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? Have you entered the storehouses of the snow, or seen the storehouses of hail, which are reserved for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you, here we are? Essentially what is being said here is that humans cannot do or know these mysteries, only God can. And then Leviathan and Behemoth are mentioned with the same type of rhetoric as an illusion. Can you pull Leviathan with a fish hook, or tie its tongue down with a rope? Can you put a cord through its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Will it keep begging you for mercy? Will it speak to you with gentle words? If you lay a hand on it, you will remember this struggle and never do it again. Any hope of subduing it is false. The mere sight of it is overpowering. No one is fierce enough to rouse it. Who, then, is able to stand against me? Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. Essentially, what is being said here is that Leviathan is quite an adversary, and no mere human has any hope of subduing it. Only God can. I will not fail to speak of Leviathan's limbs, its strength, and its graceful form. Who can strip off its outer coat? Who can penetrate its double coat of armor? Who dares open the doors of its mouth, ringed with fearsome teeth? Its back has rows of shields, tightly sealed together. Each is so close to the next that no air can pass between them. 
They are joined fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. Leviathan here is covered with a thick, scaly, armored hide that again no human has any hope of piercing. Its snorting throws out flashes of light. Its eyes are like the rays of dawn. Flames stream from its mouth. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke pours from its nostrils, as from a boiling pot over burning reeds. Its breath sets up coals ablaze, and flames dart from its mouth. Leviathan here has glowing eyes and can breathe fire like a dragon. Strength resides in its neck, dismay goes before it. The folds of its flesh are tightly joined, they are firm and immobile. Its chest is hard as a rock, hard as a lower millstone. When it rises up, the mighty are terrified, they retreat before its thrashing. The sword that reaches it has no effect, nor does the spear or dart or javelin. Iron it treats like straw, and bronze like rotten wood. Arrows do not make it flee. Sling stones are like chaff to it. A club seems to it but a piece of straw. It laughs at the rattling of a lance. Here, Leviathan is again very strong and very large, unbelievably large, with no human having any chance against it. Its undersides are like jagged pot shears, leaving a trail in the mud like a threshing sled. It makes the deep churn like a boiling cauldron and stirs up the sea like a pot of ointment. It leaves a glistening wake behind it. One would think the deep had white hair. Nothing on earth is its equal, a creature without fear. It looks down on all that are haughty. It is king over all that are proud. Leviathan is again very large and very monstrous. And this is pretty much it for Leviathan and Job. Job repents after hearing this speech and concedes that he is weak while God is strong and unquestionable. Note that Leviathan is not being described or seen by Job or the author, and he is certainly not an eyewitness. It is merely offhandedly mentioned in a speech by Yahweh. It appears the entire point of Leviathan's appearance in Job is rhetorical, to further point out the weakness, ignorance, and insignificance of humanity in relation to the universe and contrast it with the power, intelligence, and supremacy of Yahweh. We are repeatedly shown that Leviathan and Behemoth is unstoppable. Humans with all our knowledge and power are useless compared to the strength of these beasts. Essentially, the point of this entire passage is to contrast humanity's weakness and vulnerability with God's power over such creatures. Leviathan is pretty much just a symbol and a piece of imagery for the author to give the audience to relay this point. We can learn a lot about Leviathan through the rhetorical questions posed by Yahweh, essentially stating that humans cannot subdue or defeat such a powerful creature, while God can. Leviathan reappears later in Psalms within an apparent recollection of the creation of the earth by the author. But God is my king from long ago. He brings salvation on the earth. It was you who split open the sea by your power. You broke the heads of the monster in the waters. It was you who crushed the heads of Leviathan and gave it as food to the creatures of the desert. It was you who opened up springs and streams. You dried up the ever-flowing rivers. The day is yours and yours also the night. You established the sun and the moon. It was you who set the boundaries of the earth. You made both summer and winter. From this we can understand that Leviathan has multiple heads and was apparently murdered by God in a past battle, implied to be in the context of the creation of the world, just like the many other listed accomplishments God has done in the passage, like creating the sun and moon and creating the earth. The murder of Leviathan is listed alongside other aspects involved in the creation of the earth, and it seems likely that all these events are related. Leviathan's corpse appears to have been dismembered and redistributed by God as food for creatures of the earth. Leviathan is name dropped again later in Psalms, where it is listed alongside God's many works and accomplishments. O Lord, how manyfold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and large beasts. There go the ships, there is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. Leviathan is now alive and is said to live in the sea, and is named separately from the other great and small beasts of the sea. Leviathan is name dropped again in Isaiah. In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan the fugitive serpent, and Leviathan the crooked serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Leviathan is prophesied by the author to engage in a battle with Leviathan in the future. Leviathan is again specified as a serpent and a dragon, and is associated with the ocean. Leviathan is mentioned one last time in Amos, as the serpent that lives at the bottom of the ocean. Additionally, there appears to be a connection with Leviathan, a very similar creature in the Old Testament by the name of Rahab, no, not the woman, briefly mentioned in Psalms and Isaiah. Rahab appears to be a nickname for Egypt in some cases, but not so in others. God will not turn back his anger. Beneath him bowed the helpers of Rahab. By his power he stilled the sea. By his understanding he shattered Rahab. By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens. His hand hath formed the crooked serpent, Rahab. 
You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. You crushed Rahab like one of the slain. And with your strong arm, you shattered your enemies. The heavens are yours, and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. Awake, awake, put on strength. O arm of the Lord, wake as in days of old, the generations long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces and pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over? In some circumstances, Rahab is referred to as the fugitive serpent, a title given to Leviathan in Isaiah 27. Leviathan and Rahab are additionally mentioned alongside each other in some passages. Additionally, both are described as dragon-like creatures that are associated with the sea and defeated and dismembered by God in a past event. Both are associated with the stilling of the oceans and possibly the creation of the earth. And the scholarly consensus is that Rahab and Leviathan appear to be two names for the same entity, which are sometimes used interchangeably with one another. The name Rahab is associated with the Hebrew word for rage and tremble, especially its derivative to overflow, which makes sense with Rahab's association with the sea and ocean. And yep, that's about it for Leviathan Rahab. He's mentioned here and there with limited details about his origins and significance. A lot of the information about the creature is fragmentary and doesn't all fit together cohesively 100%. However, from all this, we can get a pretty firm understanding of what Leviathan is. Number one, Leviathan is a great sea serpent-like dragon creature with multiple heads. Number two, Leviathan is strongly associated with the ocean, typically the abyss or deep. Number three, Leviathan is associated with the concept of chaos and disorder in said ocean, with God stilling or calming the ocean into order alongside killing Leviathan in a big battle. Number four, Leviathan in his battle with God appears to have been originally associated with the creation of the universe. Number five, Leviathan and Yahweh are adversaries to one another. Number six, Leviathan's corpse is dismembered and redistributed by Yahweh after his defeat. And lastly, number seven, Leviathan appears to be possibly associated with the foundation of the world, possibly surrounding it or circling it with its body. It is becoming clear that Leviathan isn't a dinosaur or even a real animal in the slightest, but a mythological one more in line with the Hydra or Minotaur or Pegasus. Biblical scholars throughout history have attempted to try to comprehend Leviathan and Rahab with many vastly different interpretations. However, modern scholars commonly accept that the Leviathan that is alluded to is a primordial sea serpent which God battled at the beginning of time in order to create the universe. Some scholars have noted that the killing and subduing of Leviathan in the context of the creation of the earth is reminiscent of the creation of the earth given in Genesis, with the calming of the primeval waters or the deep that existed before. Oxford Old Testament professor John Day suggests that the creation story story given in Genesis 1 is the demythologized version of the Leviathan creation story given in bits and pieces in various other parts of the Old Testament. This battle between God and this horrible sea serpent has been dubbed the Chaos Kampf, and it appears to be something ancient Hebrews believed in but has been largely edited out or demythologized out of the biblical canon over the centuries. Now, it's rather important to take a look at the cultural context of these biblical books. To the ancient Hebrews, the original authors and audience of these texts, the main neighbors of the ancient Hebrews would have been the Canaanites and the Babylonians. Now, in the mythology of the Canaanites, we have a text known as the Baal Cycle, which is a collection of various stories relating to Baal, a storm god and head of many Mesopotamian pantheons. One story recollects Baal's battle with the god of the sea, Yam. Yam plans to rule over all the other gods and sends his servant slash pet Lotan or Litan, or the Twisting Serpent or the Mighty One with Seven Heads, a seven-headed sea dragon, to attack Baal. Baal manages to defeat Lotan, and then Yam is defeated in a big battle. Firstly, we should note that Lotan and Leviathan are incredibly similar, with almost identical epithets or nicknames, the Wiggling Serpent and the Twisting Serpent. The two are also closely associated with the sea and ocean, and both have multiple heads, and both are defeated by a god. Additionally, the description of Leviathan in Isaiah 27 verse 1, On that day the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan the twisting serpent, Leviathan the crooked serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea, is almost quoted directly from the Baal epic, created almost a thousand years earlier, where Mote, a god, says to Baal that you smote Lotan, the twisting serpent, and made an end to the crooked serpent. Again, suggesting the two creatures are one of the same, or at least related or inspired by one another. A similar myth is attested to in the Babylonian creation story of Enuma Elish. In this text, before the earth was created, there was only Tiamat, the chaotic salt water, and her lover, Abzu, the calmer fresh water. Tiamat is described as a giant great sea serpent or dragon. Tiamat and Abzu mate producing the lesser gods. Abzu is murdered by the lesser gods, and Tiamat is filled with rage and attempts to get revenge. 
She births countless monsters to kill the lesser gods. Marduk, god of the storms, engages in a massive battle with Tiamat and subdues her. He slices her corpse in two, using one part to create the heavens and the other the foundations of the earth. Again, we see similarities between Leviathan, Lotan, and Tiamat. In all three stories, a god, namely one that is associated with storms, Yahweh does speak to Job and other people in the storm, duels with a giant sea serpent associated with chaos in the ocean. In Enuma Elish, in the Bible, Tiamat and Leviathan are dismembered and reused by the respective victor gods, and both are used in the creation of the universe. Although some elements differ, many elements of the Chaos Kampf are shared between all three stories. Modern scholarship generally agrees it appears mimicry and influence from the older Babylonian and Canaanite religious stories were incorporated or inspired into the Bible and reappropriated to better fit the Hebrew canon and God. Essentially, the authors of the Bible kept the crux of the story that they've been hearing a lot from their neighbors, but recasted it with their own versions of the characters. The Hebrew authors and their audience obviously would have been familiar with these stories of their neighbors, whom they commonly traded and communicated with. It's very clear elements from both religions at the very least influence the imagery of Job and other texts. However, the Chaos Cup is more common than you'd think, and it is found outside of religions just in the Middle East, and there are in fact seemingly many separate and unrelated religions that appear to possess the common story of the battle between the Chaos Serpent and the Storm God. We actually find the story everywhere, from Zeus battling the serpentine monster Typhon in Greek mythology, to Ra battling the Chaos Serpent Apep in Egyptian mythology, to Thor battling the world serpent Jormungandr in Norse mythology, to Indra battling Vitria in Hindu mythology, and the list goes on and on, with elements of the story maybe being found as far as Japan and the Americas. There appears to be a popular mythic trope or meme that exists in many religions and mythologies. This is something called comparative mythology. It's when religions and mythologies share commonalities with one another, and it appears the Chaos Kampf is one of the most common and prevalent of all of them. Although there are many ways these stories vary from one another, they still retain fundamental similarities. In almost every iteration of the story, there is a multi-headed sea serpent creature which typically embodies chaos with a godly opponent with an association with thunderstorms. The two characters duel, and the serpent always loses. And modern religious scholarship seems to agree that the commonalities are too numerous in some cases to be pure coincidence. The prevalence of this myth or story has been debated over decades, but it appears that this is a result of both cultural diffusion, that is the communication and transmission of ideas from culture to culture, as well as a result of common origin. Across Eurasia, from England to India, there appears to be strong similarities not just in mythologies, but in the languages themselves. And from this, it is believed all cultures from the Greeks and Romans to Indians to the Norse people of Scandinavia all descend from what have been dubbed the Proto-Indo-Europeans, whose culture widely spread throughout the prehistoric world in the late Neolithic. There are a lot of videos that discuss them better than me, so check them out. The Proto-Indo-Europeans carried their myths and language with them when they distributed across Eurasia, only to grow distant and acquire differences from one another over the generations. The descendants of the Pi people all seem to possess similar myths and stories in addition to the Chaos Comp, and it is believed these are holdovers from the days of their Proto-Indo-European ancestors. The religion of the Proto-Indo-Europeans has been attempted to be reconstructed by looking at the similarities between seemingly unrelated religions. Among these similarities found in many religions are a myth about the sun and moon riding in chariots across the sky, a creation story involving two brothers, one of whom who sacrifices the other to create the world, possibly an other world guarded by a watchdog, and could only be reached by crossing a river by use of a ferryman, a world tree bearing fruit of immortality, either guarded or gnawed on by a serpent or a dragon, and tended by three goddesses who spun the threads of life. From the ferryman of the underworld Charon in Greek mythology, and Yershinabai in Mesopotamian mythology, to the giant Ymir in Norse mythology and Purusha in Hindu mythology, to the three Morai in Greek mythology and the Norns in Norse mythology. Similarities appear from all around the ancient world, and it appears at the very least these seemingly separate religions shared and exchange ideas commonly, and or descended from a shared prehistoric religion, possibly the Proto-Indo-European religion. Again, a lot of this is unclear due to how fragmentary and mysterious history gets when we go this far back. So what is Leviathan exactly? Well, Leviathan is not a dinosaur or a crocodile, but an ancient mythological creature found in many religions and probably originated with the prehistoric religion of the Proto-Indo-Europeans. The myth was so popular that it spread and was eventually adopted by the Israelites and incorporated into the biblical canon as their own version. Leviathan is a remnant of an older age, an older religion passed down from generation to generation, and it gives us amazing insight into both the origins of religions as well as how connected the ancient world was. Leviathan is essentially just a meme that caught on. Some similarities with the Chaos Conf actually still exist in modern extent religions. 
Now, one might start to notice something rather curious and reminiscent between the battle between Yahweh and Leviathan of the Old Testament and the battle between Jesus Christ and Satan, or the devil specified in the New Testament, particularly the prophecies found in Revelation. Well, this isn't a mistake. The author probably models his concept of Satan in the Apocalypse off of this concept of the Chaos Comp directly. Humans just seem to hate snakes, regardless of language and country. Anyways, food for thought. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed this rather lengthy, somewhat chaotic, no pun intended, video. As I think overly sarcastic, and no I did not mean to rip you guys off with this video, I honestly didn't, puts it better in her most recent video on Dionysus, go check that out. Religion can be a very complicated thing, and no religion is born out of a vacuum. With religious beliefs, you often have thousands upon thousands of years of complex history, and nothing is just that simple. The roots of a religion or concept can go back very, very far, and Leviathan is no different with his roots, extending probably into prehistory. This video, because of all this, has been in the works for a very, very long time. At the very least, a few years, for me. And I've had to read so, so much information on the subject. If you want to check out some of my sources on this video and subject, definitely check out the academic book, The Dictionary of Deities and Demons, which contains academic articles on the name gods, angels, and demons in the books of the Hebrew Bible. It's definitely a great starting point for anyone who wants to read about the academic consensus on many aspects of the Bible. And good news, it's available online as a PDF, so go check it out. Another great source was Professor John Day's Yahweh and the Gods and Goddesses of Cain which I bought as a physical copy in my own library. It discusses the origins and development of Judaism, many of its rather obscure references to beings and creatures, and its cultural context. For this video, I got two of my favorite artists to create their own interpretations of Leviathan, but unfortunately I couldn't fit them into the final product too well. I just wanted to give them a shout out and tell them thank you so much. Anyways, this video is way too long already, so I hope you enjoyed this examination of an obscure biblical character and how it's basically led me down a rabbit hole and discovering a fascinating conspiracy. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.